Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Uh, I'm back with another breakdown of a common system design interview question. This time we're gonna go over how to design leak code, or it's oftentimes referred to online as online judge, online coding competition, or live leaderboard. You'll see any variation of these that pop up. Uh, now, if you like our content and you want more, please make sure that you like and subscribe. I gotta say the obligatory kind of YouTube intro there, but truthfully, the, the increasing number of subscribers is really motivating to us. Uh, and I encourage us to pump out more content for you all on this channel. So if you like what we're doing, make sure you subscribe. Now quickly, for those of you who may be new to the channel, uh, by way of introduction, I'm Evan. I'm a former Meta staff engineer and interviewer. I've conducted thousands of interviews now. Uh, nowadays, I'm the co-founder of a site called Hello Interview, and we help software engineers prepare for their upcoming interviews both via free educational resources, like these videos and the, the, uh, you know, the content that's on our site, as well as paid mock interviews with senior interviewers from your target company. So for example, if you're interviewing at Google, uh, you can meet with a Google engineer or manager, spend an hour with them practicing, and they'll be able to point out exactly what your gaps are uh, to help you kind of land that role at Google. Uh, lastly, if videos aren't your thing, I've linked a written guide in the description below that you'll see. And I go into all the same topics as this video, just in written form. So I'll show you what that looks like over here. Uh, the written form, we got all the diagrams, the breakdowns, things that make this bad, good, great. As well as I think now we're up to 15 other common problem breakdowns, some deep dives, introductions, lots of good content over here. So go ahead and check it out. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and, and get started. All right, before we jump into solving the problem, as we do in every video, let's just break down the framework that we're gonna use in order to answer this system design question. Of course, this is the framework that we recommend that you use for all of your system design interviews. If you've watched any of our past videos, you know this well by now, you can skip ahead, but let me just walk through it very quickly. We're gonna start by going over the requirements. This is both the functional requirements or the core features of the system as well as the non-functional requirements or the qualities of the system. So qualities like how scalable, how low latency, things of that nature. And then we're gonna go into the core entities. This is basically the data that our system persists and exchanges via its APIs, which will transition us nicely to go over the APIs of the system. This is the contract we have with our user, of course. We're not gonna do data flow. It's less relevant for these sorts of producty style questions. Uh, so we're going to jump right to high level design where we're going to get to the whiteboard and we're going to sketch out some components and boxes in order to have a high level design that strictly satisfies our functional requirements. So it's going to be really simple at this point. It's not going to worry about scale or any of those non-functional requirements. But then we're going to move on to deep dives. And this is where we're going to go deep. So this is where we're going to satisfy each of our non-functional requirements one by one by adding to our system additional complexity to ensure that it meets all of those qualities which we defined during the non-functional requirements. So as promised, we're gonna start with those functional requirements. And this is how you should start any of your interviews. You wanna get a clear understanding of what the features are or the requirements of the system. And so if it's a system that you don't know well, then you probably ask your interviewer a number of questions here in order to understand what this think it, thing is and what the constraints are. Now. I'm gonna make the, I think, not too crazy assumption and assume that we all know what leak code is because if you're watching this video, you're probably preparing for interviews and you're probably spending a lot of time on leak code right now. Um, so what I'm gonna do is instead of you guys watching me type, I'm gonna paste in the functional requirements here, the features of the system, and we can chat about them. So the way that you can think of the functional requirements is these are usually like users should be able to statements. I didn't put that prefix here to save myself the typing, and I recommend you do the same in the interview. But we want users to be able to view a list of problems. So when they come to the site, the first thing that they'll see is maybe all of the problems that we have available to them. They should be able to click on one of those and then view a specific problem, as well as, of course, code the solution there on their client. Once they've done that, they should be able to submit that solution and then get the feedback as to how they did, if they passed all the test cases or not. And then lastly, a feature that some of you might not know about within Leak Code is that we want to support competitions, and specifically competitions with a live leaderboard. And so I'll define more precisely what a competition is a little later on when we get to it. 
Um, but for all intents and purposes, this is basically everybody starting at the same time. They have a number of questions to answer. They try to answer them as quickly as possible. And then we have a live leaderboard that shows who's currently in the lead at any given point. So those are gonna be the features or the functional requirements of our system. Now, the next thing that we do is we talk about the non-functional requirements. And so non-functional requirements, again, are the qualities of the system. Some things that you really wanna consider here are like CAP theorem. So we wanna prioritize consistency over availability or the other way around. Any environment constraints, things like scalability, latency, durability, security, fault tolerance, maybe even compliance. Those are all things that are relevant. Again, I'll paste in a couple key ones that, that I've identified here for the non-functional requirements for leak code. And note that in any system, you can go off that long list that I just said. Every system should be durable and low latency and have security and all of these things. But that's not interesting in an interview. In an interview, what you wanna do is identify like what's uniquely relevant and interesting to this particular question. That's probably a better way to even frame non-functional requirements in the first place is like, what makes this system uniquely challenging? And so you'll answer those questions, starting with CAP theorem. Um, are we gonna prioritize availability or consistency? In our case, we wanna prioritize availability over consistency. And the reason being here is you can think about any place where we make an edit, does it matter that people see it immediately? Basically, does every single write, or excuse me, does every single read need to read the latest write? And in our case, no, you could update a problem definition and maybe people still see the stale one for a couple seconds afterwards, or somebody could submit their solution and somebody might not see it update in the leaderboard within that exact second. That's okay. We'd rather that be the case, but the site always be up and available to our users. So we're gonna opt for availability over consistency. An important one that's unique to, uh, to, to leak code is the security and isolation when running user code. We'll talk more about why this is important, but of course, like we're taking in a user's uh, input and specifically code that we're executing on our own machines. We certainly wanna make sure that that's not malicious. Um, so that's gonna be something that's important there. We wanna be able to scale, but you'll note not just scale generally, we're putting this in the context of our system and we're quantifying it wherever possible. So we wanna to scale to support these competitions. And we'll say that competitions can have up to 100,000 users. That's probably something I would have asked the interviewer. And then the last thing here is we want like a fresh or near real time leaderboard. Um, so people should be able to look at the leaderboard and you know see it updating maybe in near real time to know who the current leaders are. Uh, ideally without having to even refresh their page. So here's some of the interesting non-functional requirements. These are gonna guide our deep dives later on. Now before I move out of the requirements um, while if you've watched my earlier videos, you know my opinion about back of the envelope estimations. I don't recommend you do them up front here because I don't think they influence your design yet. If you know a reason why you should, because you're trying to make a decision, feel free to do them at this point. But otherwise, what I typically recommend is that you tell your interviewer, hey, I know some candidates do estimations here. Uh, I'm gonna save my estimations for some time, maybe later in the design, if I need them in order to influence a decision. So if the results of my calculations will influence a decision, I'll do them then. But for now, I'm gonna forego. But what I do recommend that you do is that you just ask your interviewer about scalability, or excuse me, about the scale of the system. Um, so I would ask the, my interviewer, you know, how many daily active users, uh, how many problems, maybe I, I guess and make my own estimations, but you can probably just ask them. And so in our case, we're gonna have up to 100,000 daily active users. That'll be that peak that comes from competition. So those two numbers are the same. And then I looked at leak code just before this. It has about 3,200, uh, 3,200 problems. So we'll say there's 3,000 total problems. Um, so these are the requirements of the system. This is the foundation that we're gonna build upon. And our goal for the rest of the interview is to now design a system that strictly satisfies these requirements. And we wanna stay focused, importantly, to these requirements. So we don't wanna go design something that's different than this. We're gonna build up those functional requirements in our high level design and then we'll make sure we satisfy the non-functional requirements in our deep dive. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the core entities of the system. And now importantly, what I do when I'm interviewing and the suggestion that I give to all of the many candidates that I work with is that I recommend they don't document the entire data model here yet. Uh, and the reason for this is that there's a good chance you don't know it yet. If this is a problem you haven't seen before or a system you're unfamiliar, 
then documenting all of the fields or columns this early in the interview can be daunting. And the reality is it's not necessary. Like give yourself time to think of that later on during the high level design, as you'll see that we do. But what is important at this point is that you have a clear understanding of just the entities, the objects or the tables um, that are gonna be needed in your data model. And so for example, some of the things that are gonna be particularly important here, let me maybe scroll up a bit, or obviously we're gonna have a user, that one's pretty obvious. We're gonna have problems. Uh, when you submit a submission to a problem, we'll save it as like a submission record. We'll probably have some competition objects. This is gonna have information about the competition, when it starts, stops, etc. And then this one sort of depends on how you design your system and is a bit more hand wavy, but like maybe you have a leaderboard. Maybe you just query submissions and aggregate and that is your leaderboard, but I'll put it here for now. And so in a real interview, I would be clear with my interviewer and I would communicate. I would say, I'm just gonna list out some of the core entities so I can get my mind around the sorts of objects that are gonna be exchanged in the API that we're gonna do next, but I'll detail the full schema for these later on in the interview. So I'd make sure I communicate that with them. Uh, and 99 out of 100 times, they'll say that sounds great. So once you've done that, you're gonna scroll down to our next step. Maybe if I scroll up to show you, we've done the core entities. Next, we're gonna go on to the API. So we can come back down here and these are the user facing APIs. This is basically, what are we exposed to the user? And the key thing here is that the APIs are going to satisfy our functional requirements and they're going to exchange our core entities. And so you can lean on that shorthand as you'll see me do here in a second. And instead of kind of thinking about it, what are all the many API endpoints I might need for a system like this, just scroll back up to your functional requirements and go one by one through these. There's a good chance that oftentimes it's a one-to-one -one mapping for every functional requirement. There's one API endpoint. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's one to two. You'll need to be kind of a little flexible in an interview, of course. But for the most part, come up here and start with what API endpoint is needed for users to view a list of problems? Okay, so I can come down to my API and I'm gonna say, view a list of problems. What is that going to require? Um, this is gonna be a Git endpoint. It's gonna hit some problems resource. Of course, I can put my API version, whatever. I know some folks like to do that. It's, it's not the most important thing in my opinion. Um, and this right here is probably good enough and that I'm getting a list of problems. I'm gonna add some, some extra stuff here, which is that you know I can probably filter on things like a category or maybe a difficulty, uh, difficulty. And then I probably want some pagination here. So I can just do page-based pagination. I'm gonna do a, the general page there, as well as the page size. Uh, there you go. So that's my basic get problems. And what does it return? Well, it returns a list of problems, but maybe importantly, and this is fairly minor, but what I would call out in my interview, just cause it takes no time is that problems are gonna be probably pretty large entities. They're gonna have test cases and you know, the code stub and all this stuff. And I don't need that at this point. So I really just need like a partial problem. I'm deriving this from TypeScript, this term partial, you can use whatever you want. But the point is I'm telling my interviewer that I recognize that I want this thing to be fast and it can be fast by minimizing the payload size. And I can minimize the payload size by just sending over the wire, the things that are interesting here, like the ID, the name of the problem and the difficulty and maybe the category, right? So that satisfies viewing a list of problems. The next one is view a given problem and code a solution. And so for view a problem, the code a solution happens client side. So we're gonna say view a problem is also gonna be a get, probably that same problems resource. And then I'm just gonna use a path parameter here instead of a query parameter. And it's gonna be the problem ID. And so just quickly, the distinction here is this notation that I did where it's a question mark followed by all of the ampersands. Uh, these are called query parameters and they're useful for when things are optional. And then path parameter, so this is just gonna be problem slash and then the problem ID or the problem name. Um, these are for when things are required. Basically, you need a problem ID in order to view a problem. Otherwise, there would be nothing to view, right? And this is just gonna return that problem. So there's our first two API endpoints. Uh, the next one is that we wanna be able to submit a solution. And that'll of course give us feedback. And so we can have our submit solution. And on submission here, 
We're gonna have some post endpoint because now we're creating a resource, we're creating an entity, we're creating a row in our table, a submission row. So we're gonna post. Um, and then, you know, the name of the resource here, this could be submissions, this could be problems still. Some people care a lot about this. Most interviewers don't, and I certainly don't. I don't think this is the most important part of the interview. Um, so I'm still gonna do something like this. I'll probably just post to that same endpoint. Um, maybe you can put like a slash submit there, but I know people get all kind of upset about verbs and things too. I've read your comments. Um, <laughs> but the important thing is it's a post endpoint here. I'm gonna post to the problem ID that I'm solving for, and then I'm gonna maybe get in response the submission object that was created, but I need a post body here. And so I'm gonna say what code uh, that I'm sending, that's gonna be important, of course. The language uh, that I'm, I coded in, because I can choose from different languages, so maybe it's Python, something like this. And then maybe optionally, I have a competition ID. And so this is, if this was part of a competition, I would send over the competition ID as well so that we could associate this submission with the competition that I'm a part of. So this is probably good enough. One thing that I will note is like, if the code was really large, maybe you wanna up, uh, upload it separately, like to S3 first, get back that S3 URL, and then just pass in here the S3 URL instead of all of the code. The reality is, I'm not too worried about that here, and I'm gonna put the constraint that you know user solutions can only be up to a couple, uh, you know, maybe tens of kilobytes at most. So I think it's still fine for us to put in the body, but that's something to note. And then the last requirement that we have here is that live leaderboard. So we wanna be able to get that leaderboard, uh, and I'm gonna say, you know, get leaderboard. And that API endpoint, of course, is gonna be a git again, well, maybe say there's a leaderboard resource and then we'll need that path param because it's mandatory of the competition ID. And then because this could return up to 100,000 participants, we'll want pagination here as well. So again, I'm gonna do simple page-based pagination. Um, Cursor-based is the other option, but I'm gonna do this. Uh, and that is going to return, we'll say that leaderboard object. Uh, so there's my APIs. Again, the key here is that I have an API or at least one API for each of my functional requirements. Basically, I've satisfied my functional requirements with my APIs, these are user facing. I paid attention to some, some relatively important things, like if it's gonna return a lot of items, then having pagination is smart, some filtering here. Query params for when it's optional, path params for when it's required. When we're posting, we can of course use the post body in order to post more information. Um, but now with these in place, we can use these in order to now build our high level design. So as a reminder, the goal of our high level design is to satisfy those functional requirements. And so we're basically just gonna again, go one by one through these functional requirements or one by one through our API since they were derived by the functional requirements and build up a really simple system. We're not focused on scale or anything yet, that's gonna come later. We're just gonna focus on satisfying each of those requirements. And by working linearly here, it's gonna help us stay super focused on the task at hand and not ultimately get distracted. And so one common pitfall that I see when I'm interviewing candidates is that they start to get distracted by all these additional things that can happen. You know, maybe they're designing something like a Yelp and they need to introduce reviews and they start talking about replies to reviews or comments or admins coming back and, and emailing the, the person or replying to a review. It's like, this is all a distraction. We agreed on what the functional requirements of the system were up front. There was a reason for that. And so let's make sure that we stay focused and adhere to them because ultimately we only have 35 to 50 minutes depending on the length of the system design interview from the company that you're interviewing at. So I'm gonna start with this view a list of problems or satisfying this endpoint here. What is the simple thing that we can do in order to satisfy that? I'm gonna start drawing over here. The first thing is that we have a client, of course, this is the, the client that's interacting with our website. And then I know in many of the other videos, we opt for microservices right up front. This is generally a good strategy. In this case, looking at the functional requirements, things look relatively simple and straightforward to me. So I'm gonna start by just having a simple server, client server relationship, no microservices. If we need to break this up later as we keep going, maybe we will, but I'm gonna start simple. And I'm just gonna call this the primary server to start. And then I'm gonna introduce a database. This database is, of course is gonna for now to satisfy this requirement, 
store our problem entity. So we got that problem entity there. This is our database. And so we talked about in our core entities how we would come back and define some of those data models. This is the time to do it. So when you're actually in your design and you've introduced something, you know what you need there. So what's gonna happen when a user requests to see the problem list? Well, they're gonna wanna see problems and these problems will have something like an ID, probably a name, uh, a difficulty we said they would have as well as a category. And so that's all they have for now. We're gonna add things probably later as we fulfill more of the high level design and more of the requirements. But let's start with that for now. And so when a user goes to view the list of problems, the client's gonna make that API request here to our primary server. Our primary server is then gonna query for all of our problems and return it back. And of course, we had some pagination here. We had some filtering. So this is just gonna be simple uh, kind of where clauses if we're using a SQL database or filtering uh, depending on the database that we're using. Now, the choice of database here, one, we could punt on this decision until later. I'm gonna say that for this problem, it doesn't really matter. We're not doing anything fancy. There's very few number of users. We only have 100,000 uh, 100, daily active users. That's not a lot at all. There aren't a ton of writes uh, and there aren't, as a result of the daily active users, a ton of reads. So go with your favorite database here. Postgres is fine if you wanna go the SQL route. If you like a DynamoDB, that's great here too. Don't overthink this decision. It's not the most important thing given there are no kind of key insights like uh, you know, really high rate throughput or something that's going to dictate us making a different decision. So viewing a list of problems, super simple. Now what about the next one? View a given problem and code a solution. This is equally simple. So maybe I'll label my endpoints here just to be clear. The first one that we have here is get problems. And then now we're doing get problem. These are all coming in here. You can label these in your interview if you want or not doesn't make a ton of difference, but I just wanna be clear in this video. And so this next one, very similar process. The client asks to get the problem. We're gonna to go to our database, query by our problem ID. This is probably going to be our primary key so that it's easy for us to query by. It's nice and fast, great. And we'll return that problem ID. No problem, easy, we'll render it to the user. Now, when a user clicks on a problem, they expect to see some more stuff than just this though. At this point, they're gonna need a code stub and I'm gonna say code stubs because we're probably gonna have some object there which has the different code stubs per language. There's test cases here. Uh, you know, there's gonna be some description of the problem. Of course, in leak code, maybe there's solutions or sorts of all, all, all sorts of other stuff, but that's the main things that are relevant. So you can see how so I'm adapting my data model as we go. Great. So now you have viewed a problem. In order to answer that problem, well, you're gonna just do that on your clients. This is kind of a small thing. Uh, Monaco, there's different editors or IDEs uh, that are open source. Uh, Mon Monaco is one of them. And so you can basically just have that, have that editor, have that IDE, that light, simple IDE directly in your browser so users can uh, write the code directly there for the problem that they're viewing. Next up, we're gonna look at what happens when you submit a solution and you wanna get feedback. How are we gonna implement that? How are we gonna implement this submit API endpoint? And so the simplest thing that you could do is that you could run the user submitted code directly in your primary server, in your API server here. So this basically means saving the code to a file in the local file system, running it, and then capturing the output, saving it to the database. Um, this is a terrible idea. Don't do it. Th th this really sucks because if a user submits malicious code, code that we don't trust, and they absolutely could do this, then it could do all sorts of naughty things. It could take down our server, compromise our system. They could delete data since we're connected to the database. They could DDoS us. They could, how they could mine crypto. I don't know. They could do all sorts of naughty stuff in here. And we don't want to let them do that. Um, so anytime that you have user code where you don't know what it could be, it could be anything, running it on a primary server that's connected to your other services is a bad idea. You need isolation. Isolation is the key word here. And so for our high level design where we're doing something simple, maybe it's fine to just say that you're gonna do this. I know that typically that's the pattern that we follow, do something simple in high level design and then layer it on later in the non-functional requirements. Now, because this one is so naughty, uh, I would probably recommend just kind of like upfront addressing it. I would feel pretty uneasy as the interviewer if a candidate just proposed that they were gonna do this and moved on. Now you could say, I'm gonna run it in the primary server for now, because it's just the high level design, I'm gonna come back to this and I'm gonna improve this because I know that this is a big security concern. That would be okay if you wanna proactively communicate that. Um, but if you know it's an issue and you know some solutions, then even though it's the high level design, 
maybe you just jump in and solve the problem. And I'm gonna do that here because I don't want anybody to, you know, only watch up until this point in the video, think that this is an okay solution, and then go do it in an interview. Um, so let's talk about what some other options are. Of course, as I said, the issue was that we need some isolation. We can't let them run in the same place as the file system and the database, etc., of our primary server. And so we could satisfy this isolation by running a VM or a virtual machine on the primary server here. So let me just kind of draw that. This could be a, a VM to run code. Uh, and VMs provide a fully isolated environment on top of the server. And so this way, if there are any crashes or any malicious code or anything bad that happens, they're totally confined to this box here. They're totally confined to the virtual machine and they can't impact the primary server at all. And so there's, there's still some issues here. The main issues with the VM is that they're a decent amount of overhead. They run an entire operating system. They run a full OS. So they're really resource intensive. And this basically means that you're gonna need more of these primary servers. You're gonna need a bunch more hardware in order to support all of the different VMs in order to run user code. Because of course, in the future, we're gonna to need to scale this. Um, and the VMs, because they're so intensive, they can also lead to some, some slow startup. And as I mentioned, that inefficiency of resource utilization, us needing more hardware. So they're not a great option. Now we can get around both of those issues, kind of that slow startup, the resource intensive nature, by instead making this a container and so what we can do is that we can use something like Docker containers, where unlike a virtual machines, containers share the host operating system and they only package up the application code and the dependencies. So they're much more lightweight, they're much more efficient and allows us to run more instances of this container on the same hardware and thus of course spend less money. So what we can do, I'm actually gonna copy this again because this will be a little bit more to draw. Uh, but we can have all these containers down here. Uh, so we can have a container for each runtime that we support. This is basically all of the different code, Java, Python, etc. And so what the containers are gonna do is that they're going to install the necessary dependencies. So, you know, uh, all of the necessary dependencies to run JavaScript, Java, Python, uh, etc. And then they're going to run that code in these sandboxed environments in each of these containers. And then they can respond to the primary server which with, with whatever the result was and update the database. And so but before I kind of talk more about that flow, I wanna throw out one other great option here. This I think is the one that I'm gonna go with. But another great option here is to use what are called serverless functions. And so a good example of this is like AWS Lambda. You may have heard of that. Great thing to, to look up if you haven't. But these serverless functions are just small, stateless, event-driven functions. Now, it kind of sounds fancy. Uh, that run in response to triggers. So just like an HTTP request, like a REST request. Um, and they're managed by cloud providers like AWS, and they automatically scale up or down based on demand. Basically, instead of having a server or a container that's always sitting here, because these exist on servers, of course, you basically just make an HTTP request that telling AWS Lambda, for example, that you need some resources, it pops up uh, you know, a little resource, uh, which is the Lambda, which can then be configured with the runtime environment support, et cetera, in order to run the code and do the same thing. And so these are always here sitting, waiting. We can hit them, run the code. In the case of the lambdas, there's nothing here. We have a request to run some code. We tell AWS, I need to run some Java code. It pops up a machine or a par portion of a machine. They handle that internally. That needs to run that code. It takes your code, runs it, and gives you the response. And so that's also a great option. Candidates can absolutely use lambdas or other serverless functions here, uh, works great. The problem with lambdas is that they have an issue with cold start. So when you go and you request it and you want it, then it's gotta be pulled up and it's gotta download the dependencies and get itself into a state where it's ready to run whatever code it needs to run. And so there's been a lot of work in the AWS team and strategies in order to avoid this cold start problems. You can warm them up, have them already there, of which case you sort of just have the containers here. So. Anyway, any option works. I'm gonna opt for this. So we have kind of an additional server here uh, or a handful of servers that are running each of these different containers for our different runtime environments, our Docker containers. And so now what happens is that the primary server is gonna pass the code down to these guys. They're gonna run it. There's gonna be some response. Maybe there's errors that happen, success, failure. Of course, they're running test cases. Give that back to the primary server. And then the primary server 
is going to update that by saving it to some submission. And that submission, again, we talked a, a little bit about the fields that are gonna be needed here. It's going to have you know, probably the, the test case results, uh, pass or fail, so maybe I'll just call it passed and we can make that a Boolean. Uh, errors, if they existed, how long it took to run. Some of that sort of stuff is gonna come back from our containers and we can store it here as a submission. All right, we're almost done with our high level design here. If we come back, the last thing that we need to do is support these competitions and a live leaderboard. And so the first thing is we should define a competition over here. We're gonna have some competition. It's gonna have some ID and it's probably gonna have a start time and an end time. Maybe there's some restrictions or things like this. It's also gonna have some problems. I guess what I should probably do, forgive me here, I maybe should have stated this earlier, is what the heck is a competition? We sort of need to define it. So in an interview, maybe earlier on, hopefully, or at this point, you're gonna ask your interviewer, what is a competition? And so let me define that up here. What is a competition? We're gonna define it as follows. So we're going to define it as this. Competitions have some start time. They last 90 minutes. And there's 10 problems that uh, uh, you know, the folks competing need to try to solve. We can have up to 100,000 users per competition. And the way that we determine a winner is who solves the most problems in those 90 minutes. And in the case that people have solved the same amount of problems, then it's whoever solved them faster. Okay, so that's what a competition is. So when we come back down here and we define our competition object, we have the ID, start time, end time, and then that list of problems. This of course is just gonna be the problem IDs. Um, but the list of problems, the 10 problems that are involved in this competition, okay? And so now when a user comes and they submit something or they try to run their code, then they're also going to have the competition ID that they're involved in. So there are some things that we need to add to our submission here. The competition ID, I guess we forgot this originally, I forgot this originally, the problem ID, the user ID, and then it's kind of obvious, but I'm just gonna add our user entity, ID being the only relevant field. Of course, there's other things, but you and the interviewer both know what they are, so we don't need to put them. Um, but so now we have this submission. It's got the competition ID, the problem, and all sorts of information. And so as far as the high-level design goes, when we wanna get the leaderboard, uh, I guess I should have had that post submit here too. What did we have that as problem slash ID? And then now we're gonna have that get leaderboard right? And so that's going to be the idea of the competition. And so when we want to get the, get the leaderboard, um, what we could do in the simple way is just have our primary server query our database for all of the submissions for a given competition ID. So we'd make that the primary key. And then we would group by user ID. So how many are completed there? Where past equals true. And then we would further sort in case of tie by the completion time. Um, so we should probably have completion time or creation time here as well. And so that would be what I would do for the high level design, just super simple. We'd have a query there. What the heck would that query look like? I don't know if it's the most interesting thing in the world, but I, I just wrote it out and can paste it here. So we'll select the user ID, the counter, the count of uh, those past submissions, um, and then the maximum of the submit time. Uh, or submit it out. I guess this should probably be the min one because we want the shortest there. Submissions, filter by that competition ID and past equals true. So that may or may not be perfect. Uh, I wrote that fairly quick just before this, but it's not the most important thing and you wouldn't write this query in your interview. You would just explain to your interviewer that you could very simply query the submission table, grouping by user ID, and then using completion time or the submitted at time in order to do that ranking in case of ties. What I would also do at this point is I would call out to my interviewer that like, I recognize that this is inefficient. I recognize that it would work, but it would be a pretty expensive query, especially if we have a lot of people trying to hit our leaderboard. And so I would let them know that that's one thing that I'm gonna call attention to that I'm going to go try and fix in my deep dives. But for now, if you look at our design here, what we have is a design that successfully satisfies our core functional requirements, the core features of the system. Users can view a list of problems by making a request to the primary server, and then we'll return all of the problems back to the user to be shown, allowing filtering on difficulty, category, etc. 
They can view a given problem by providing that ID to the problem that they're interested in. We'll fetch it based on primary key and return to them the relevant code stubs, test cases, etc., for them to be able to code their solution on the Monaco IDE here. And then when they submit the solution, we'll take their code, we'll pass it to one of our containers here based on the appropriate runtime, we'll run their code, we'll take the result of the output, store it in our database as a submission entity, and then pass the result back to the client, letting them know if they passed or failed. And then for competitions, we have this competition object that an admin or whomever would create ahead of time, slightly out of scope for this interview. But more importantly, when a user submits, they'll also provide that competition ID in the case that they're competing uh, in a competition, as we see down here in our API. We'll then attach that to their submission. Um, and then when we wanna see the leaderboard, we'll just query the submission table grouping by or selecting only those within a competition ID, grouping by the number that have passed by user, and then sorting by the speed that it took them to complete that latest question. And then we can return that back to our client. All right, so now it's deep dive time. We have our high level design in place which satisfies those functional requirements. And now we're going to add upon that high level design in order to make sure that we can satisfy those non-functional requirements. And we'll go deep in a couple of areas to make sure that we satisfy these additional requirements. And so we can go one by one through these again. We'll start with security and isolation when running users code. So we talked about how we already satisfied a good amount of this by using these Docker containers here. This satisfied the isolation component and largely the security component as well because we're separate from the primary server and we can't access any of the resources like our database or our primary file system or anything over here. But there's a couple other things that we wanna consider. So despite the fact that they're running in the container, there are a couple things that could still go wrong. Now, what if a candidate just had in their code an infinite loop? They just had a while true or something. Well, we would end up giving them to one of our runtime services, one of our Docker containers, and it would just run it infinitely. And that Docker container would be forever preoccupied. And we'd need to spin up another container uh, and waste the resources indefinitely on that one container that has that while loop. And so what we can do there is that kind of the most obvious thing is we can have an explicit timeout per execution. And so we can say that code can only run for something like five seconds, for example. And if code runs for longer than five seconds, then we're gonna kill it and return an error back to the user. And then similarly, we don't want a user who just does a bunch of fork bombs or kind of excessively uses memory or excessively uses CPU on any of these given containers. Um, so for that, we can add CPU and memory bounds. So these containers can be configured such that they have a really tight limit on their memory and CPU. And if that limit is exceeded, then the whole container just gets teared down and we'll pull up a new one. Uh, of course, returning the error back to the user, maybe not being explicit so that they don't try to like kind of reverse engineer how they can take advantage of us. But these are really the two main things. We wanna ensure that users can't abuse the resources and make run up our bill. And to satisfy that, we can have those timeouts and, uh, and CPU and memory bounds. Um, some other things that I'll just mention here, which are less important, but also interesting, is like we'll probably have a, a read-only file system on these Docker containers. So we won't let people kind of mess with the file system at all. For the code, we'll just write to the temp directory. That'll handle some issues that could potentially come up there. We probably want network isolation. Like they, they definitely shouldn't be able to read our database or access our primary server or anything. Um, so we can have some basic network isolation stuff in place. This is like VPC controls in the AWS ecosystem. I'm not gonna talk too much about that because uh, it's not the most important thing. You can do some additional research if that's something that's interesting to you. And then some stuff like, you know, we can enable it such that it doesn't allow system calls on the box. So, you know, you can't mess with the underlying system or operating system. Next, let's end up doing the fresh and near real-time leaderboard. I know that we're going a little out of order. The order here doesn't particularly matter. We just wanna make sure that all of these are fulfilled. Um, but as you'll remember in the high-level design, we talked about the limitation with fetching the leaderboard being that this query, specifically over here, was gonna be super expensive. Um, so that's the first problem that we wanna solve. And then the second bit is this near real-time portion and freshness. We want users to be able to have their leaderboard open and then just kind of have it updating without them needing to refresh their page. And so we want it to update every you know, couple of seconds, near-ish real time, whatever it may be, so that they can see any changes that might've happened to the leaderboard. 
And so in our current implementation, we're gonna run this big expensive query, which if we're aggregating over 100,000 things here, this might take several seconds to run. Additionally, it's gonna cost a decent amount of money. If this is 100,000 entries, each entry that it needs to aggregate over, it's a couple hundreds of bytes. Um, like if this was DynamoDB, and I, I think that we've determined maybe it's Postgres, but it doesn't really matter as an estimate. This is like on the order of 50 bucks per query. Uh, you can see a breakdown of how you would calculate that on our DynamoDB write-up on the website using write capacity units. But the thing that's important here is that this is expensive. It's going to take too long and it's going to cost too much money. So we need to first start by solving that. And so the most obvious thing that you could do is you could introduce a cache. And so by introducing that cache, maybe we'll say it's Redis, uh, Redis cache. What you would do is that you would query the database you'd run this expensive query, and then you would cache the result. And then everybody else who tries to fetch the leaderboard is just going to hit the cache. But of course, we don't want them to hit the cache forever because very quickly this leaderboard is going to become stale. So we would need to introduce a TTL here. So there would be a TTL of maybe 10 seconds or something. And so somebody would request uh, the leaderboard from the database, we'd run our expensive query, we would cache it with a time of, uh, of 10 seconds, for the next 10 seconds, everybody is gonna hit that. But then when 10 seconds elapses, this is gonna get removed from the cache and it's gonna be a cache miss. So they're gonna go run the expensive query again and again, repopulate the cache. And so you probably see what the issue is here. Both that first user and every unlucky user who hits us at the 10 second mark is going to have a cache miss and they're gonna to have to run the query, which we've cut down on the amount of times we need to run the query significantly. We've saved ourselves tons of money. Um, but we led to a pretty bad experience for that unlucky uh, user that hits us at, at the boundaries here. So how can we solve that? Now what we can do is we can update the cache uh, on every single write. That's one solution here. Actually, before I do that, let me propose a different solution first. So another solution is that we can have a cron job or some you know, scheduled worker here whose job it is to refresh the cache. And so this cron job might run instead every 10 seconds or so. And now it's going to every 10 seconds query the database for that expensive query and then update the cache. Those arrows should be single, not double, but I'm gonna delete that in a second so it doesn't matter. And now we don't need a TTL here. Every 10 seconds, this guy's gonna go run the new query and then save the fresher data in the cache. Now every single user hits the cache. This is great, right? There's never anyone hitting the database other than this cron job, which runs once every 10 seconds in order to make sure things are fresh. So that's fine. This is still kind of expensive, but on the order of things, not really, who cares? And it doesn't matter if it takes a ton of time. Uh, it's having a slight impact on freshness, but at least all of our users are always hitting the cache. So they're always getting kind of this O of one here. And well, what's in the cache? The cache value is just a string. Uh, as a reminder, Redis is just key value pairs. So the key here is probably something like a string leaderboard colon the competition ID. And then the value is just some JSON blob, which is basically the result of this expensive query. And so it'll have you know the rank list of users as well as each of their scores, whatever it is that we need to ultimately send back the client for them to be able to render the leaderboard, right? So that's what we have here. Now, the main issue with this approach, if it's run every 10 seconds is that this cache is pretty stale. Users are gonna be requesting the leaderboard, they're gonna be maybe polling, kind of calling every couple of seconds to see if there have been any updates, and nothing's gonna change except for on the 10 second-ish boundary. And so this might be fine, uh, it's probably too long. Obviously you can just lower this, make it five seconds, maybe even less. If you start to go below that, then you know, you're running the cron job uh, you know, pretty frequently maybe at a rate that's even more frequent than the amount of time it takes for this query to return. Like if this query takes four seconds to return and we're running this every three seconds, then we're gonna be overlapping with our previous query and need more cron jobs. Um, and that might be too much to manage. So my point is this solution could work. It's not terrible. You're gonna have a little bit of staleness. You're gonna want this cron job to run more frequently than less frequently, but it's maybe not perfect. You could get away with this. Uh, the thing that I don't love about it is that you've introduced kind of an additional dependency here, this cron job that's going to have to run. If it has issues, like maybe it goes down or somebody pushes bad code to it, then the cache is never going to get updated and we're going to all of a sudden have some 
you know, call it a thundering herd on our database to do this expensive query, and that could really cost us. Um, so for that reason, I'm gonna opt to not go with it, but just know it's an okay option, especially if you did that in a mid-level interview, I think that's totally great. Even in a senior interview, it's not a terrible suggestion. Um, I wouldn't necessarily count it against you, though it's certainly not the best. Now, the other thing that you could do is you could just update this on each write. And so what you could do is you have your result come in, you update the database. Instead of doing this query, you would do a cheaper query, like for this user, how many submissions have they had and what's the time of their last submission? And then go update just those values in this JSON blob. And so this would mean you'd have to read this entire thing into memory, parse the JSON blob, update it, and then resave it to Redis. And so that sounded like a lot of work. It kind of is. It's not great, especially because you can have some races here, like everybody's having submissions at the same time. And fortunately, Redis is single threaded. So this would still work, uh, especially since users can't like submit two solutions back to back. They're gonna always be different users. This is again, it's an okay solution, um, but you're reading a large-ish amount of data, especially if you have 100,000 users, it's not just large-ish, it's like actually large, into memory in order to do some kind of updates and then writing it back to cache. And then how are you gonna make sure that these remain consistent? It's a little bit more difficult. And so that solution also works. Again, everybody's just hitting the cache and we never have to run this query. That's pretty nice. Um, but I wanna introduce something that might be even better. And that's that in Redis, it's just key value pairs. It's an in-memory data store. We have a fantastic write-up written by my co-founder, Stefan, uh, on, our, on the Hello Interview website. Click on learn at the top, system design, and then Redis, and you'll see it. And it explains how Redis works. I'll give just a slight overview. Redis is made up of key value pairs where the value can be any data structure or most data structures. It could be something like a string or a basic type like it is here, or it could be one of those data structures that you know well from all of your studying of DSA. And so one such data structure that exists is something called a sorted set. And so sorted sets are just collections of unique elements where each element is associated with a score that defines the order of the element in that set. So it's a ranked set essentially. Uh, all these elements then are ordered by that score. And this is gonna allow us to do efficient range queries, like retrieving the elements within a specific score range or ranking. So if we go back to our pagination here on our leaderboard, if we want say the second page, 100 things, then we want just the leaderboard or the rankings between 100 and 200, we can do that really easily with sorted sets. And the time complexity, it's in memory, so it's wicked fast. We don't have to do any querying. Um, and the time complexity is O log n. So pretty quick there. But now what we would end up doing is that within our sorted set, uh, the element would be like the user ID and then kind of the thing that it's ranking on, ranking on the score that we would have with it would be its computed score, which is gonna be based on the, the number of submissions. And then maybe we add some decimals uh, for the submitted time to make that the, the, the tiebreaker. But for simplicity, the score here is the number of completed or past submissions that they've had, right? And so now we can always just query this in order to get the latest leaderboard. Walking through that, a user submits their code, we run it, we then uh, update our database, you know, write the additional submission to our database, and then go to Redis, and for that user in the sorted set, if they passed, we update their score and do whatever calculations their score are necessary based on that last submitted time. And so now it's a little bit easier to keep these consistent. We're writing and reading just a little bit of data from the Reddit, uh, to and from Redis as opposed to that huge blog. And we still maintain that all of our users end up hitting the cache and they never have to run an expensive query. So that's a fantastic option. Now, in order to keep things like near real time here, I would first ask my interviewer, what is near real time? And I would maybe make a proposal. And I would argue that in this case, near real time is like three to five, two to five seconds. The reality is submissions aren't coming in that quick. And so if we just refresh every couple seconds, it's probably more than good enough. I'd make sure that I get a consensus with my interviewer on that. But if that was the case, then what I would do here is I would still just pull. I'd pull every three seconds to get the new leaderboard for whatever page I'm on. Um, and then I would fetch you know, the scores just from within the, that start and end offset. And then I would update it on the client. Now, every time I ask this question in an interview, candidates naturally want to introduce WebSockets or server sent events, some sort of persistent connection in order to truly do this in real time. 
And I think it's an interesting thing to bring up. I would bring it up in an interview. Um, but I would actually point out that I think it's over-engineering for this case. And the reason is introducing WebSockets or SSE comes with some meaningful drawbacks. It's a lot of additional infrastructure to maintain. You need some sort of a WebSocket manager. You need to now not have stateless servers, but servers that are maintaining state, which has some consequence to fault tolerance and durability. And so the added over the, the engineering overhead that's introduced by bringing in WebSockets or SSE, uh, I don't think is worth that couple of seconds of more real time in a submission. And in an interview, these are the exact conversations to bring up. Like that's an interesting trade-off to discuss with your interviewer. I recognize that this solution exists, but given the constraints of this problem, I think it's over engineering and polling, despite how simple it sounds, I think would actually be the optimal solution. And that's why that's what I'm gonna go for. You know, this is what I would say to my interviewer. Hopefully that makes sense. One additional thing that I failed to mention is that now that you're writing to both of these kind of databases, the database and the cache at the same time, you'll generally have the concern about consistency. Like what happens if you wrote to this one and then your primary service uh, server went down before you wrote to your cache? Now your leaderboard's always out of date. There are a lot of different ways to handle this. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all of them. One potential solution is that you use change data capture, something that we've talked about in a number of other videos. And so off of your primary database here, if it was DynamoDB, this is DynamoDB streams. If this is Postgres, I think they call it something different, logical replication or something. Um, but what effectively would happen then is instead of an arrow there, you would just write it to your database. And then CDC captures an event stream of all of the changes that have happened to that database and puts them in a queue. You would configure this. And so like you could put Kafka here, for example. Um, but you know, there's gonna be some, we're gonna, the, the change data capture, excuse me, the event, stream is going to be put onto some queue or some stream like a Kafka. We'll have some worker that pulls off of Kafka and then writes it to the Redis cache. I'm gonna extract that all away with just the CDC edge. But that's one way that we can make sure that if something is written to the database, it's also written to the Redis cache. And then if our cache ever went down, well, we could catch up um, by just reading the latest things off the stream. More likely, we would probably just read from the database and load back up and start from where we were. But you have some options there. Okay. now. The other one that we're going to talk about, it's going to be the last one that we're going to talk about, availability versus consistency, is a little less interesting in our implementation. We've already implemented something that prioritizes availability. We don't have, you know, ACID properties paramount in our database with transactions or any consequences to locking or consistency here. So kind of uh, by, by the lack of that or the absence of that, this is prioritizing high, high availability. Uh, of course, we'd have the basic stuff like load balancers between each uh, in front of each of our servers that score scale horizontally, all of those things. I'm not even going to mention them necessarily. Um, maybe worth mentioning in a mid-level interview. For all other interviews, it's kind of obvious and inferred, so not the most important thing. But we need to talk about the scale to support competitions with 100,000 users, and that'll be kind of similar to the availability stuff here. Um, so as I said, horizontally scale this, sure, whatever. Um, but more importantly, what are we going to do down here? So the consequence to this is that we could drop a submission and that would be pretty bad, especially if a user gets to the end of the, of the competition, they submit their last thing. We come in here, we have a bunch of people who are submitting towards the end and we don't have enough containers up. And so we can't do anything. We just end up dropping their request and maybe sending them an error. And now they're disappointed because it impacted their result and their score and now their profile doesn't look as good and they're in our email and all sorts of bad things happen, right? So we don't want to drop those requests. We want to be able to scale to this big surge of 100,000 things. So what are some things that we could do? Well, we can proactively just horizontally scale these a ton. We'd have a bunch more Docker containers. These, of course, are running on servers. We can have beefier servers. We can have more of them. And as a result, we can kind of buffer any big um, you know, amount of submissions that come in at any given time. That's expensive because we're going to load up on all of these servers prior to a competition. We're not going to need any of them until potentially at the end. And maybe we didn't guess right. So maybe we still drop things. So it's not perfect. Another thing that we can do uh, and that we would call that pre-scaling to put a word on it. Another thing that we can do is something we can call dynamic scaling. And so if these containers are running in uh, you know, AWS or any other cloud environment, um, then you can use cloud services that have some sort of auto scaling. So maybe this is like AWS Fargate with ECS containers. Um, and what you can do is you can specify a memory um, 
or a CPU limit for which we need to pull up more containers. So if your containers hit some limit in their CPU or memory consumption, we'll automatically pull new ones up. If they go below some lower limit, we'll automatically tear them down. This way we can dynamically scale. And so this option is not bad, but the reality is it probably can't be dynamic enough. If we get to the end of the competition and we all of a sudden get like 100,000 submissions, then we're not gonna be able to auto scale fast enough to be able to handle that. So instead what we can do and what we should do is introduce some buffering here. So I'm gonna move things around a little bit. And when a submission comes in, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it first on a queue. And so this is gonna be some message queue. It could be Kafka, it could be AWS SQS. Either works here, we're just using it as a very simple message queue. So the choice there isn't that important. And we're gonna put the, uh, the submission on AWS, on that message queue. And then we'll have some worker that pulls it, pulls those uh, you know, code run requests or those submissions off. This arrow is just one sided. And then that worker is going to go over to our Docker containers and say, run that stuff. And it's gonna get its response. And now when it gets its response, it'll go to our primary server and say, you know, write, write this submission data. And then we'll do that same flow that we did a moment ago where we write to the database, CDC updates the cache. So by doing this, we've introduced this queue importantly as a buffer so that if we have a huge influx of things that are coming, they'll just get queued up. We'll be dynamically scaling this as fast as we can. And then the workers can horizontally scale as well. They'll be pulling things off of the queue. And then so long as there's enough capacity here, they'll hand them to each of these guys in order to run the code. And if anything failed for some other reason, maybe we can add retries, some other durability properties there now that we have the queue. Um, but I'm not gonna go into as much detail for this particular interview. Um, so this is a good approach, but one thing that's interesting here is now we've just made submissions fully asynchronous. And so how does a user know whether their submission passed or failed? This gets a little interesting because now we have a primary server that's putting it on a queue. It could in theory wait here on the queue for a couple of seconds. Runtime could take up to five seconds. And then the worker comes back to the primary server, maybe after 10 or so seconds. This is too long traditionally to have a single rest request open. Um, and so we need another way to notify our user that their submission either passed or failed. And so the way that we can do this again is just with polling. You could open up a WebSocket or an SSE connection. I'm gonna make the same argument I made for the leaderboard and say that polling is totally sufficient here. And so I would introduce like another API endpoint, let me move things around here, that is something like this, uh, checks, problem, uh, you know, maybe it's the problem ID, and then like a submission, and then a submission ID, or something like this. Um, and this is gonna be what returns the actual submission. This is now just going to be a 200, or failure, or whatever error code. error code. And so a user is gonna kick off their submission, where it's gonna post here, go through all of this, run, come back, update the database. And then meanwhile, they're gonna be running that get check call, which is gonna to go to our primary service and look in the database for that submission ID to see if it already, if it exists, and if it does, pass or fail. If it doesn't return, you know, it doesn't exist yet. And then the client side logic will know to keep trying that at least for up to five seconds before it shows an error to the user. And so inter uh, interestingly, this might sound not that sophisticated, I guess, to some watchers of this video, but I want you to go over to Leak Code and submit your code at Leak Code and open up uh, you know, your inspect element console in the network tab there on the right if you're using Chrome. And you'll see that every three seconds, there's a request to a slash check endpoint. And so they do exactly this, they pull. And it makes sense, it's a simple solution. Why over-engineer if you don't need to? Um, so that's how we would scale, we would introduce the queue um, and then maybe one thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say here, I don't want this video to get too long and I don't want to get distracted by things that aren't the primary focus here. But of course, when you introduce a queue, you don't want to store large amounts of data on that queue. And so if our problem solutions end up being pretty large, kind of similar to what I talked about in the beginning, then what you're likely going to do is introduce S3 here and store the solution or the code solution itself. Oh, oh store the code solution itself in S3 
And then we don't need to put the code in AWS. We would download it again from S3 in the worker before passing it to each of these guys. But that's small and minor. I just want to make sure people you know, might notice that and comment in the comments. So I'm just not going to focus on it here, but that is how you would handle that. All right, just like that, we have a, a design here that crucially meets all of our functional requirements and our non-functional requirements. And this is really the moment in the interview when you know you've done a good job. If you can look at your system here and you can go back through your functional and non-functional and say, check, 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 I've met all of those, then you should be leaving the interview feeling pretty confident. And so quickly, let me just give an overview maybe of what I'd be looking for at each level here. I know I went into a bit less of that than I do in, in, in kind of the normal interviews. I don't ask this question typically of staff candidates, though I have seen it be asked at some of the major things of staff candidates, um, but I think it's a little on the easier side. And so as a result, I usually ask it for mid-level and senior candidates. For mid-level candidates, kind of the main thing is that you realize the importance of the code isolation. Usually just running this in Docker uh, or in some Lambda is a great first step there. I wouldn't expect that you're able to enumerate maybe all of these things are important, but usually having some explicit timeout uh, is really important, that's good. So Docker container and some timeout would satisfy all of this. I'd want you to recognize that this query to fetch the leaderboard is super slow and not optimal. So maybe that caching solution with the cron, jo uh, cron job to constantly refresh the cache, that would be great, that would be passing. Uh, I'd want you to kind of recognize, or at least I might bring up the question to say something like, uh, how are you gonna handle that, that scale, that influx at the end of competitions? And you should be able to brainstorm some good ideas there, whether it's kind of pre-scaling, auto-scaling, or ultimately this queue. For senior candidates, we'd, we'd, we'd want to be able to land uh, probably closer to this queue solution, or at least have some good justification for the Lambda and how you're going to pre-warm it uh, so that we don't have that cold start problem. I'd like you to get uh, the, the cron job at least. Maybe you come to something closer to this, not necessarily with the Redis sorted set. That's great to see but there are other variations that would work all the well. But likewise, you should know that this, this query is suboptimal. Um, you should recognize all the same things about security. Maybe you bring up one or two additional ones here, like the CPU and memory bounds was an important one. But if you do all of these things in either the mid-level or senior interview respectively, it's likely gonna be a hire. Um, okay, so that, that wraps things up for us. Thank you, everybody. If you made it this far, congratulations. I think this ended up being over an hour, so apologies. It's a little longer than I usually aim for. Um, one thing that I will actually mention before you sign off is that we've been working on something new over at Hello Interview. I'll link this in the description. But we've been working on these things called guided practices. And they allow you to try the problems that I have YouTube videos for here yourself. You basically answer a question step by step the functional, the non-functional core entities, API, all the way to high level design and deep dives, drawing them on a whiteboard. And then you're able to get some instant feedback on your solution. So I think it's a really opportune way to practice hands-on as opposed to just reading or watching content. Now, as you're seeing at the time of this recording, we just have Ticketmaster up on the site. You can try that now. Um, by this time next week, you'll also see uh, at least four additional other ones, including leak code, which I've, I've just finished locally here. So. Uh, try that out. I think that'll be interesting for folks and a great opportunity to practice, like I said, hands-on with these problems. Um, lastly, comment, uh, like, and subscribe, of course. Let me know what I did wrong, as always. Let me know if you liked it. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, and I try to respond to as many comments as possible. So we'll, we'll have another, another interview uh, breakdown here in the coming two to three weeks. I'll see you guys then.